My name is uh, Amr Abdel Awi. Uh, I'll be moderating the session. Uh, where we have, uh, what I expect, uh, two interesting perspectives on, 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 on how design uh, approaches and innovation can, can contribute to, to the notion of urban development. Um, sorry for the delay, we were asked to wait a bit because of the uh, delays in the start of this morning, uh, probably due to traffic and stuff like that. But, uh, in any case, we're ready to start now and make up for that time. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to present um, Mukina Makeka, um, who is the principal and founder of Makeka uh, Design Lab in South Africa. And um, Mukina was chosen by Herzog and Demora uh, to be part of the almost 100 global architects. Uh, he is a two-time recipient of uh, the CIA Award of Merit and uh, a 2010 nominee of the Johnny Walker Celebrating Strides Awards in Design. Uh, in addition to sitting on the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council for Design. So, uh, uh, he is also an external examiner at Columbia University and uh, lectures at Cape Town. Um, I believe uh, he will share with us his perspectives on, uh, on, on, on identity, politics and aesthetics and yeah. architectural practices. Yeah. Please. <coughs> Good morning, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you to the moderator, thank you to the colleagues uh, for what I hope will be an exciting morning where we're going to discuss um, um, certainly architecture and urban design but in relation to uh, urban development practices. I want to tell you, uh, I need to give a confession. Um, I changed my presentation late last night. Uh, my first ideas was to talk about public space in Cape Town and, and uh, try and understand that, but I was particularly struck by the Cairo 2050 uh, sort of thinking. And because I had done a Cape Town 2030 process, I thought it would be interesting to try and share perspectives on what we have done. And perhaps that could be uh, a bit more useful to talk about a particular public space within Cape Town. One of the key drivers behind this uh, particular project, and I think it's important to, to, to locate it in, in a broader sort of framework, uh, has to do with the issue of uh, climate change as well as um, resource scarcity. Um, the 2030 timeline, which is seen to be over here, is quite interesting because this is the sort of oil peak scenario that has been uh, forecasted. This diagram was done about three years ago. Here you can see Cape Town and Johannesburg's population was tapers out. What we're finding is that the sort of mega cities, and in fact Cairo should be here, their population is increasing quite substantially. And what that means is that there's a substantial pressure on diminishing resources. So uh, secondary and tertiary uh, cities, uh, which aren't as powerful, still have to compete to buy oil like any other sort of city. And it means that these secondary and tertiary cities have to think very cleverly about what will the world be like in 2030, 2060, 2050 and beyond, and how does it begin to protect its own resources. Cape Town as a city itself, this is a diagram, <coughs> this is the sort of what we call the city bowl, it's contained by a mountain and the uh, ocean along this side, and you can begin to see that um, there's been lots of discussion about how sea level rise would change the form of the city, and that begins to put a pressure on the particular type of land massing and how one thinks of urban development. My client um, in this instance was what's called PRASA, which is the Passenger Railway Agency of South Africa, so it was actually a railway authority which is the, one of the largest landowners in the country. Um, it goes back to about 100 years when uh, these um, engineering entities were given huge tracts of land. So when we were faced with the question of how does one think of the city in the year 2030, it wasn't driven by the city. It was actually driven by a substantial landowner. And I think that's an interesting <coughs> way of beginning to unpack, I mean, who are the, the right type of agencies that can make a difference. We had to deal with a number of concerns, integrating different forms of transport, um, but it wasn't just a transport problem, it was about how does the transport actually develop and support community building as well as connecting people together. I developed a, a matrix uh, against which projects could be judged and as well as designed and very often what finds the transport projects in it. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> Mobility is the most important thing. 
as well as operational efficiency and output, I said that it's important that justice features in the design process and that governance <coughs> sorry, is another feature which actually makes <coughs> appropriate development. So this sort of wheel allows one to make decisions about how to how, do, how does the, the station um, unlock itself? Another important step was a vision that was developed by the client but in public participation processes. So that is an important thing. When one creates a vision for a city that's, uh, that has a sort of horizon outlook, it's very important that it's not driven by the bureaucrats who run the organization because it actually impacts on the city and many neighbors. So we went through a fairly extensive process to create a holistic vision around what the project could be. We made an argument that the station um, needs to be the city's core transport and activity hub, and is to position Cape Town as an inspirational world city, and I think that's quite important. So, so how do we take this infrastructure, not just make it work, but how do we make it a place where people are inspired and they can operate in different ways, and it's about making a city of opportunity, equity, and sustainability. So what will happen is that we, we set ourselves a very high task to say that a 2030 vision needs to respond to these sorts of criteria, and to, th to think about providing um, developmental leadership. Now, I just want to take you through a couple of diagrams around uh, Cape Town and the province uh, in which I live. This is essentially the sort of uh, provincial footprint. Cape Town sits right over here, right on the edge. This is where the harbor is located. This huge sort of belt on that side denotes an area of extreme poverty. And wealth in, in Cape Town is really distributed along this sort of configuration. And as you can see, the transport a grid along over here is very, very poor. So there's a vision, a 20-year vision that was developed in the city to use Cape Town Station as part of setting up a new grid which would allow public transport infrastructure to be accessible to different communities. So it's not a ring road system, it's about the equitable grid that is applied across uh, the city as a whole. Um, these diagrams allow the opportunity for not only people to move, but the flow of goods, the flow of ideas, because what we're finding is the apartheid plan <coughs> structured the city in such a way that there was a core area which was wealthy and white and a periphery which was poor and black. But the major train station is in the city, so everybody has to go in to go back out. It was a very uh, strange sort of uh, planning diagram. We then overlaid this sort of strategy for the station in terms of um, where are these stations located in relation to urban development. And just zooming in over here, one can see these, these are the different sorts of stations. And the idea being that prior to 1994, railway lines were actually used to divide communities. So when they wanted to separate black and white people or colored and Indian people, they used the railway line as a physical barrier to prevent development. So infrastructure was actually used to divide societies. Uh, it wasn't just about access. So my theoretical proposition was how do I use that same infrastructure which divides two communities to actually connect the two communities. Um, and that, would, that was also part of the 2030 vision. It's about how do we deal with not just the transport issues but legacies of separation. We then overlaid this grid with the, the public open space system within the city. You can see it's a fairly sort of linear arrangement as well as the sort of, um, um, uh, sort of informal settlement fabric that sits along the side. Uh, but also what, we, what was called developmental opportunities by the, by the, by the city, um, and then began to make an argument for how the transport infrastructure can effectively connect the city. But I think it's quite important to, to maybe state a couple of things. The red uh, denotes the actual site itself. The railway land is this whole piece of land going up over here. You can see it actually separates the city from the sea, which has a sort of economic impact. The port is run by another separate authority, which is not, uh, is not publicly accessible. And District 6, uh, this is what um, uh, Cape Town is famous for. I'm, I don't know if you know the movie District 9, or that sort of science fiction movie. It was a play on District 6. This is where uh, people were forcibly removed um, in the 60s and the 50s, but actually going back uh, to the sort of late 1800s. And what effectively happened is that we have a very um, homogenous uh, central city which is defined by race and the potential for this station development to actually bring people from poorer communities so they have opportunity to live and be in the city directly was what we thought could be the potential for this project. It was important to overlay it with history. On the tour yesterday, one of the reasons why I changed the position was we, we went through the, the urban core, we walked through the city of the dead and 
I heard that part of this 2050 plan was going to remove some of the historical fabric, which I thought was uh, quite a, uh, in my mind, a, a strange idea. I mean, maybe I need to be told why it's a good idea. So what we did is look at our sort of historical fabric, where markets used to be, the old military hospital, all these sorts of artifacts, because in fact, this is where the coastline used to be. It's currently been reclaimed in 1948. So we have a, a whole wealth of historical artifacts that are underground and need to be considered when one does urban planning. A core idea that came out of this process was to ask the question whether the station needs to move out of the city, move more towards the periphery of the central city and therefore allow better connectivity to other communities, and that there are other forms of minor stations that could begin to occupy the city on that side. So it was a, a transport and strategic argument about where do you locate a station in response to uh, appropriate developmental needs. Our mandate as given to us by our client is this sort of area. And we were driven by one very core idea, uh, because if we were to retain the station within the central city, but we were to sink it underground, it would allow us to uh, access all the land above it for development, allow the city to reconnect itself with the sea, but also allow the potential to allow for a land on a different property structure. Uh, than, than currently provided by the, the wealthy elite that sits within the city. So it was a bit of a subversive project because we were saying that transport infrastructure is part of the state. The state's mandate is to make an equitable society. We don't have enough housing for the poor and so on. How can they possibly you know, occupy the city in different sorts of ways? So it, it seems to me very different to how the 2050 is conceptualized in terms of what is the class audience of the project, whereas in this one it was very much about trying to uh, bring in more equity. This is the sort of uh, footprint that we were you know, forced to explore, a very narrow uh, piece of land. Uh, the sort of strategies about how do the, the train tracks um, increase and go underground. This is an, uh, a larger sort of perspective on what that would actually mean for the central city by creating a new station on the, on the outer edge. And this is <coughs> the, the impact of what it could potentially mean. We managed to, to put this side by side with the, what we call the District 6 framework, which, which uh, we estimated about roughly 45,000 inhabitants. There was our particular project, which we saw would be another 45,000 people. And then, of course, the sort of motor city precinct, which is about 10,000, Kulumborg, another 30. And this, I mean, the, the numbers, I'm, I'm actually scared to tell you the numbers, because you Kyrenes have to deal with huge, huge numbers. <laughs> But let me just say that this project would double the density of the city, which obviously would help in terms of economy and so on, because we actually have a very low density city, because apartheid kept people apart. It's very different to Cairo, where you've got the type of densities in position. Um, and this is how we, we imagine the urban fabric could be continuous. So instead of having railway lines that cut the city and prevent movement, now all of a sudden the, the city grid begin, begins to be permeable across it. We map this across the different neighborhoods, many different communities and in a very particular way. This is our sort of density diagram that shows you that the central city, which is the lightest color, actually has the lowest density, which is counterintuitive. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense that the central city is the lowest density. Um, and I showed this diagram that on the periphery, which is on this edge of here, is where you have the most population, and the central city is actually quite low. And these are things that need to be changed. Now this diagram begins to illustrate um, the case that we have to make because there was a comfort zone in, in Cape Town about the current densities. People didn't understand why do you need more people. They didn't understand how that affects businesses, how that affects uh, the use of infrastructure that becomes more efficient, how that affects public transport. And we had to make a case by comparing different cities and saying, well, you know, if you like London, look at London's density. If you if you like Mumbai, look at it. if you look if you like Amsterdam. Um, understand that Cape Town is actually quite far behind. And that's another thing which I think is important, which is to discuss the quality of life that you actually want in your cities when you talk about these sort of visions. We then apply the concept to say, well, you know, if this is a Cape Town station, you know, over time it could become a, a transit-oriented development along an urban corridor, that this idea could be replicated at scale, um, and that what could then happen is that uh, the city could be quite permeable with roads going across it, public infrastructure, and you see here that the public open system, which is that green sort of spine over there, is actually an acknowledgement of the historical infrastructure that's underground. So in other words, we didn't just 
raise a line through and like a straight line and you know line up with houses we said well this used to be the old fort in 1650 so we're not going to build on it we'll build around it this used to be the military hospital in the 1700s we'll build on so the public open space system carves and moves in accordance to what is existing so again that that seems to be different to what i hear about the 2050 project which is about this very strong linear idea going towards the pyramid uh, this one seeks to be a bit more organic, it, it, it twists, it turns, it's, it's, a, it's, it's responsive. And then we managed to, to take this to the city and demonstrate that this method, although it starts here, could eventually be replicated along all the railway lines throughout the whole metropole. So effectively, the railway lines which divided people before now become this sort of zipper or a, a stitch that, that connects people together. So um, this, this is a, that diagram of the, of the historical overlay. I think it's quite interesting. These diagrams are, so these little triangles are shipwrecks of, of about 20 that we found. This is an old jetty that's currently underneath the ground. This is the line of the, the coastline. I mean, the first one was here, it moved there, and now it's at that position. These are the, the Dutch uh, embattlements because of the, you know, the ramparts and the walls. Uh, the original castle, so basically by overlaying the the historical fabric with the current existing transport needs, you can actually design uh, something that's quite uh, quite interesting. And what it also means is that your public open space system now is informed with history, which allows for tourism, it allows for social identity. Um, you can create new public spaces without obliterating the old ones, which I thought was uh, quite an important concept for us. And essentially this is what it, what it meant in sort of um, three dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, as I've mentioned before, the, the mountain contains the central city as well as the harbor, so there actually really isn't much room for the central city to expand. You can see here the, the, the stadium, which is regards to the, the World Cup. Uh, residential, high residential, uh, high value residential fabric at the back, and then essentially this sort of, what we call the sort of east city, which, which would be very much for young people coming into the city, um, not as wealthy, but it's about this railway opportunity giving them access to the capital that resides in this space. So you can use your transport infrastructure to, to provide job opportunities by bringing people in. We then took another level and we split up the site into different neighborhoods, gave them a, an, an identity. We didn't just have an urban plan, so there was one which was a cultural center, museum, contemporary art park, etc., but also um, strong social services, which I think is very important in any long-term plan. So a police presence, law court, home affairs, um, as well as housing. Then we had another precinct, which is about technological research and educational center, uh, coffee shops, cinemas, art galleries, and so on. Another one, which is a government services neighborhood, because we saw that government could be a, a, a substantial tenant in the vision, as well as helping to, to make it work. So we had loft apartments for parliament, which is literally you know, a kilometer away, uh, recreational spaces, etc. Health and lifestyle, which allowed us to tap into sort of health industries, pharmaceuticals, to say, well, why don't you do some research on site and have your residential component? Um, and essentially came up with a sort of uh, a very rich mix of activities in place across the city. And I think it's quite important when one does a vision that you don't just say, you know, it's quite important to not just say we'll have offices. You have to begin to imagine what are the needs in that particular area, what are the economic development challenges, and what are the what are the sort of uh, potentialities, if you will, for making a different approach? So this was what one of the scenarios that, that emerged out of that process in terms of the, the urban massing. Uh, another sort of scenario on this side where the, the buildings are somewhat different. The railway infrastructure which goes underground and gives a sufficient capacity for the, the city to function from a transport perspective. And again, this is another, uh, another view from above. This is another potential view from below. It's a bigger vision. That's uh, different pockets and this is just to give an indication um, using a photo of what we're talking about this is that area which was had forced forced removal the district 6 area that I mentioned this is the, the site the, the railway site as you can see literally divides the city quite substantially so now we're getting connection across it and this is a, a substantial contribution to to how the city would transform itself and we proposed a, a transport museum uh, that would sit above the, uh, the train concourse that was underground. And um, what, what's fascinating for me about this project, I think I mentioned it um, the day before yesterday, is that it was, it was controversial because it would, it would shift the power balance of the city in a number of ways. So 
politicians in that area who were continuously voted in by the constituency would now find that you know 50% of their constituents are drawn from a different income group, a different class group, you know, so that was a threat to the system. The city of Cape Town was threatened because they wanted to plan everything, you know, they had a city, but you know, 40% of the land in the city is owned by the railway lines, and the railway wanted to make sure that they contribute. So there was also a bit of attention about who has the authority to change the nature of the city. And then I think the third dynamic, um, which is an important one, is in, in South Africa, local transport is meant to be underneath the domain of the city, but the railway agency is a national entity. So there was also the politics of the national, uh, called the ANC narrative that was trying to make a more equitable, uh, racially diverse city, but then local government that was threatened by the prospect of this huge project that would change the city. So it, had its, it has its own controversies. I think it's important to state that. I'm not saying that it works, I'm, but I think it's quite interesting understanding the, the, the institutional uh, challenges, the, the issue of uh, a collective vision, uh, and the issue of saying, if you make a 2030 project which is dealing with climate change, it's dealing with oil peak, it's dealing with other sorts of mode of production, how do you, how do you actually make a project which um, begins to address these things? I will play a very, very short video, if I can find it here. Um, let me make that bigger. Um, and that is my presentation in brief. I'm, I'm hoping that in this workshop discussion that, that um, I will learn more about this um, Cairo vision and understand to what extent did civil society participate in it, what are the objectives of it, how does it work, who is the intended audience, um, how does it really serve Kyrene's needs, um, how, how will its success be measured, and, and if there's any opportunity perhaps to see how that process can be um, adjusted by Kyrene's um, <clears throat> looking at maybe some of the stuff that we were thinking about. So, so if I can play this. Connected Cape Town is an integrated mixed-use development that seamlessly connects public transport modes, serviced by a full range of low-carbon intensive transport modes, with a particular emphasis on light, tram and electrical personal transport tailored towards the needs of the pedestrian. Connected Cape Town is typified by its iconic and vibrant central spine, which not only plays host to a real 24-hour lifestyle, but is a major contributor to the biodiversity of the CBD, and offers a range of historically informed public spaces, offering a blend between culture and public space making. Boarding a train, we enter the Health and Wellness Precinct, neighborhood D, housing a fitness park, a public swimming pool, and squash and tennis courts. This precinct offers residents an opportunity to care for their bodies and well-being as easily as they would their economic well-being. Clinics and healthcare centers are complemented by open spaces, a research center, as well as high-density housing. This creates individuals and communities at work and at leisure who are informed by a value system of mutual respect and human solidarity. Using the many forms of sustainable, pedestrian-friendly transport available on the site, one enters Neighbourhood C. Dedicated as a service precinct, Neighbourhood C offers government services and social services, such as paying new school bills and daycare and kindergarten respectively. Beautiful recreational spaces and government staff housing make Neighbourhood C friendly, relaxing, and efficient destination. As we move into neighborhood B, we enter a site of innovative technical research and education. The spirit of the entrepreneur thrives here, with restaurants, cafes, stores, a food market, and various forms of micro-industry. Complemented by a fire station and a resource center, neighborhood B is an incubator of economic and technological advancement. Neighborhood A, which lies at the heart of the CBD, houses a cultural center, a museum, an art gallery, and a memorial park. In line with emphasizing the heritage significance of the site. The neighborhood is also home to the Department of Home Affairs, the South African Police Service, law courts, financial service institutions, as well as high-density urban housing. 
the seamless integration of the precincts, underpinned by various and diverse transport modes, serves as a connection between our past and our future. A connection between mountain and sea. A connection between rich and poor. A connection of ideas and dreams. It is a place for all, leading the way in an equitable Cape Town. A just Cape Town. A vibrant Cape Town. Welcome to Connected Cape Town. Climate change showed that um, weather was going to be more extreme in Cape Town, and we have a condition where there's lots of wind. So as opposed to having large wide boulevards, we decided to put the buildings close together so that you can actually break down the wind at scale and create more shadows. So the urban form there anticipates the type of weather patterns that we were told would exist from about 2030 up until about 2090. And I think that's an important thing because the buildings are unfamiliar. And I think also when you, when you project forward and you say, what will the city be like? You have to ask the question about how will, will the weather influence the architectural language, and I think um, that's a design challenge in and of itself. It's not enough to take a sort of Versailles a Paris model and assume that it, it will work. I think climate is really beginning to change how cities work, and I think designers need to respond accordingly, and that's my contribution to the workshop. <laughs>